Yo, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to the EPM show. This is all things enterprise performance management, and we're here to give you an unfair career advantage. My name is Chad Pike, and I am your host today, and we welcomed John Sanchez onto the podcast. John is a highly sought after corporate finance speaker and trainer. He specializes in helping finance professionals accelerate their influence and grow their career. He's the Managing Director of Financial Planning and Training at FPNA Group with more than 20 years of experience at a top 10 accounting firm and holding various leadership positions at Fortune 500 companies. And today he dropped some knowledge. He talked about how to overcome some of the most common mistakes that hold EPM professionals back from growing their influence and why too much knowledge can actually hurt our ability to influence in our career and the importance of honest feedback and how that can be an accelerant to you, even when it hurts a little bit. And finally, how to set a clear direction for your career and then reverse engineer your big goals. This episode is chock full of practical insights and takeaways that you can implement in your career tomorrow. I hope you enjoy. Check it out. John, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, man? Good. I'm pumped to have you. I'm glad that we've been able to be on each other's podcast now. This has been fun. This is fun. I love doing this. Yeah. It's, it's, well, hey, we'll jump right into it. Give the audience your career flyover in 60 seconds, and I'll put a timer on and ready, set, go. All right. So I started out in public accounting. I started at what at the time was the 10th largest CPA firm in the world. They, in 95, merged into E&Y, transitioned from that into corporate finance. And I worked in different types of corporate finance and financial planning and analysis roles at companies like Arby's, Royal Caribbean Cruises, and AutoNation. AutoNation was my last big company FP&A job, and they shut down the business unit that I was in. So me and about 450 people were all looking for new work all in one day because they closed the business unit down. Luckily for me, they hired me back as a consultant, and I was doing kind of technical FP&A consulting work up until about 2013. Somebody asked me if I'd be interested in speaking at a budget and forecast conference. I did that, got bit by the bug, and since then, I pretty much focus on doing developing and delivering training for accounting and finance professionals. Did I get in for a minute? Crushed it. You had 15 <laughs> seconds left. Give us something else. Where are you from? Grew up in South Florida, so I moved 12 times before I graduated high school. I was an army brat. Okay. But the, the, the majority, the place that I lived the most growing up was South Florida, Homestead. Specifically, it's the, the town you hit right before you go into the Florida Keys. Okay. So. Very nice. And just for the audience to know, John and I actually both reside currently in Charlotte. John, the next thing we like to do is we like to ask just a fun, surprise, personal question on the show so folks can get to know you a little bit better. So my question for you today is, who are you at the wedding party? Are you DJ? Are you drinks are on me? Are you the guy who's kind of off to the side, just having conversations? What is your persona when you hit the wedding reception? Okay, so this is not my wedding. I'm, I'm a guest. Yeah, you're a guest. You're a guest at the wedding. Yeah, so, so depending on how you know me, this might surprise some people. I'm probably just going to hang back with okay. people that I know really well. I'm naturally introverted, even though I talk for a living. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd probably just hang back, have a few drinks, and talk to the handful of people that I know the best. Okay. I was like that early on. And then I got married. My wife just is the, the spirit of every party. She just brings the party and she is on the dance floor in the middle. And so I have been forced to learn to get comfortable with that. <laughs> so she'll probably laugh when she hears this, but it sounds like your wife and my girlfriend are similar in that regard. She's okay. told me one of the things I like about being in a relationship with her is that she's super outgoing and extroverted Yeah, and she loves variety. So it kind of pulls me out of my shell. Cause usually once I start, getting out and interacting with people. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just getting started sometimes. That That's makes sense. I... Well, hey, variety is the spice of life. John, let's jump in. I know you, you spend a ton of time training finance professionals, FP&A professionals. That's obviously very closely related to EPM. We see a lot of finance and accounting folks transition into enterprise performance management quite often. So 
that's why I'm super excited to have you on because you train FPNA professionals on how to improve their communication skills and their influencing skills, which what better career advantage is that? So start out by just telling me a little bit about some of the most common mistakes that you see finance professionals make when it comes to improving their influencing skills. So I think probably the lowest hanging fruit, the, the easiest, quickest thing they could do that most of them don't is just spending more time on it. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a project the AICPA has had for decades now. It's called the Vision Project. And they rank different skills they want accountants to have. And one of them has always been communication skills. Mm -hmm. But when I look at all these conferences I go to, they don't tend to focus on them very much. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, number one, just prioritize them. That would be a big thing. And then the second one is mindset, because I run into a lot of people that say, well, I'm just not fill in the blank. I'm just not good with people. I'm not good with names. And communication is like most other skills. It can be learned. And with the right training and repetition, just getting your reps in, you can get better at it. It reminds me of just this idea that you can tell what's important to someone when you look at how they spend their time or how they spend their money. And so if yeah. growing our communication skills are important to us, then we need to invest our time into that. And sometimes even invest our money into it a little bit, whether it's taking a course or attending a conference that addresses it or whatnot. But if someone said, okay, that makes sense. I want to time block weekly to work on my interpersonal skills, my influencing ability and skills, what should they do in that time in your opinion? So I guess the first thing is I would start with, you don't necessarily do, need to do some kind of formal assessment, although that's useful as well. And they are out there, there's lots of them. But you could start out by just making a list of the things that you feel like you need the most help in, right? So for me, I've always been kind of naturally introverted. I, I wasn't good at ice breaking. So I started out with, well, how do you get a conversation started? And then once you list the skills out, start to identify sources that can help you with that, whether it's just reading books, going to training seminars, watching videos, whatever the case, there's lots of good stuff out there beyond what, what I do as well. And then it's just putting in the time, man, it really is. And fortunately or unfortunately with communication skills, you can't really improve them a whole lot by yourself. You have to actually do the thing to get better at it. So what I always advise people is whatever you're trying to practice, find a low or no risk opportunity to do that. In other words, don't practice in a job interview, right? Don't practice in a big meeting at work. Practice with your significant other, your brother or sister, your best friend, someone who can give you feedback. And if you don't do well at the thing, they can give you honest feedback, but it doesn't really hurt anything because you're not doing it in a high risk environment. As you were talking about that, I was thinking, okay, let me try to acquire some some head knowledge. Let me read a book. Let me go to a conference about how do I present better in a meeting? How do I tell better stories when I'm presenting some of our findings for some type of an analysis we're doing or a model that we've built? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to effectively tell that story to non EPM professionals who aren't as technical. So how do I do that? And I was even thinking along the lines of bringing this up to your manager and telling them, Hey, this is a developmental area for me. I'm focused on are there any low risk projects or like roles I can take within our, our existing team that will help me get some of these reps? So I also think about it in terms of advocating for yourself once you kind of have built a baseline of knowledge, because we can read books all day long, right? But to your point earlier, if we don't put the reps in, we're not going to get any better. The thing that bums me out is that there are not more companies, like I know when you and I talked offline. And when I interviewed you for my show, you talked about that leadership development program you were in or the company you were mm -hmm. at. And I wish more companies had that where there was already a structured way for people to get a lot of that experience in different areas that they wouldn't otherwise get. I wasn't fortunate to have that, but I was fortunate in a couple of jobs to have just individual bosses who acted as mentors. Mm -hmm. That's critical to have that mentor and they can be such a catalyst for growth and propel your career when you have the right mentor. So that's another good lesson is find someone who's really good at that on your team, even if they're maybe just a few years ahead of you, or ideally they're further ahead of you and yeah. ask them for time. Absolutely. I know the other thing 
that you were super passionate about when it comes to maybe common mistakes or what prevents people from growing their influencing skills in their career is the curse of knowledge. Can you just talk to me a little bit about curse of knowledge and what that means? Yeah. So the curse of knowledge applies to everything, right? It's just making the mistake that thinking that everyone else knows all the same things that we know. So when you're proficient in an area that's highly technical, like accounting or finance, we tend to do a lot of talking in acronyms and shortcuts and lingo. We have like a whole vocabulary within that niche in finance and accounting, EBITDA and Kager and all these different acronyms that we use. And amongst ourselves, it's a shorthand and it's helpful and it's useful. But a lot of times people will use that same type of language with people that are not from an accounting and finance background and it goes over their head. And I think the worst thing that could happen, it's great if they say, hey, I'm not, I, I didn't understand what you were saying. What is that EBITDA thing? What does that mean, right? A lot of people are never going to ask the question because they're embarrassed. They don't want to seem stupid, mm. right? So I don't want to use the term dumbing it down, but we want to think about who our audience is. What are some of the things that we tend to take for granted in the language that we use when we talk amongst ourselves? and then figure out how to put that in the simplest possible language, right? So I, I like to tell people EBITDA for someone who's not finance, if we had a business and we were selling stuff for cash and we put the cash in a little cigar box, and then when we had to pay for stuff, we took the cash out of the cigar box and paid for it, that cigar box is EBITDA. Mm -hmm. It's what went in plus what came out, but just on a cash basis, right? It's pretty easy to kind of visualize that Right? It's not a perfect definition, but it gets the idea across for someone who's not a financial accounting person. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you're listening to the show, I would encourage you to think about what are those technical terms that folks might get lost in and they might not understand. But when you're talking to a fellow model builder or an architect, they're going to understand the shorthand and it's efficient and it makes sense. And then we have to tweak our language when yeah. we're presenting in products or we're working with the business and things like that. What is one commonly held belief about effective communication or being able to influence people that you passionately disagree with? I think I touched on it before. It's the, I'm just not good at fill in the blank. I run into so many people that just believe that if they're an introvert, they can't be an exceptional communicator or they can't be good at a specific type of communication, like speaking in front of groups and meetings or doing presentations. And nothing could be further from the truth. I shared with you my own story mm -hmm. about how I had a total lack of awareness about how I was coming across to other people. And I just started working on it. I just started reading books and doing training and different things like that. And if you just get that out of your head, you know, like people that say, I'm just not good with names. Well, if you keep repeating that to yourself, you're selling yourself the idea that you're not good at remembering names, right? So that's probably one of the biggest ones for me. That's really good. Can you actually tell that story for the audience just so they can kind of understand? Because I think this is a great example. Yeah. So when I was working at AutoNation, I was a manager in the corporate development group. And my job, I managed a five-year strategic plan for an $11 billion revenue business unit. And all of my work went to very, very senior people. So for me, I was still in my 20s. And for me, that was a very, very stressful job. I was always focused. Like if I was walking down the hall on the way to a meeting, I was looking at the report that we were going to talk about in the meeting. So we're at a happy hour one night. And I'm talking to a couple of people who I just met that night. They worked at AutoNation, but I would not met them before. And I said something. And one of them laughed. And they said, you're, you know, you're funny. You're actually a nice guy. And I was like, thank you, I think. Like they said it like they were surprised. And I asked them, well, why do you say it like you were surprised? They said, well, we weren't going to say anything. We kind of thought you were a jerk because we've passed you in the hallway several times and we said hi and you didn't say anything. We thought mm. you were ignoring us. And what I realized is I was so focused on the piece of paper in front of me or the meeting that I was going to, I was completely unaware of what was going on around me and how people were perceiving me. Um, and that's kind of when I started, I was just like, you know, I hate people like that. I, now I'm that guy. And I just, I got there just because little by little, I just got so wrapped up and so stressed out in my day to day that I lost track of the other stuff. That's such a powerful example. And 
you know, it's, it's a blessing that for you, that was a wake up call at a happy hour and it was early on in your twenties. Cause yeah. how, how different does, does a career look if you don't get that wake up call until you're 45, like 20 years down the road. Right. Yeah. And so I think the takeaway there is find people that are in your sphere of influence, maybe colleagues you work with friends, go into a couple different arenas and ask people, Hey, like, how do you perceive me? What are some of the ways that you perceive me? Is there any, do I come off as harsh typically than ways that I'm not aware of? Is there anything I should know in terms of how I come off to people? If I can tag on to that part of that same story, I quickly changed the subject when they said that, cause I was kind of embarrassed. And the next day I went to a few of the guys in my department that I work with all the time that I trusted. And I thought for sure I was going to ask them and they were going to tell me, no, you're not like that. And I asked them like, do I do that? And they're like, yeah, dude, you do it all the time. So that exactly what you just said, that feedback from somebody that knows you well enough to give you informed feedback, but that you trust. Like when they said, yes, you do that all the time. I knew they didn't have any hidden agenda. They were just giving me honest feedback. And that's mm -hmm. really important. How do you handle that? So you've gotten this feedback, take me four or five days later, maybe you sat on it over the weekend. You know what I mean? You're coming back in on Monday. What do you do with that? Cause I could see going down two tracks. One, Hey, I need to get better at this. And this is a blessing that I've heard this, even though it maybe hurts a little bit, but then the second track is, well, I'm just going to ignore it. And I'm going to be a little bit bitter about it. And I could see it actually yeah. compounding the problem a little bit. Yeah. I'd love to tell you, I jumped on it right away, but I think I probably molded over longer than I needed to because I wasn't sure what to do about it. I knew it was an issue, but I think for me, partly I was a little confused because I always felt like I could get along with anyone. And here I was mm. rubbing people the wrong way. So I kind of felt like just this confusion about how I got there. But eventually I think it, it may have been something as simple as like a Tony Robbins infomercial in the middle of the night where he's up there talking about personal development. I think it was like unleash the power within or something like that where he was just talking about all of these different principles about personal development, even way beyond just communication. And then hearing that and seeing that made me aware that there was more stuff out there like that, right? More training material, seminars, books, stuff like that. And I had not been into personal development before that. That was one of the first ones that I ordered actually was Tony Robbins stuff. And that kind of started it. One of the things you said earlier that I keep thinking about kind of on this train of, of getting better and improving in areas where maybe we're historically we're weaker in, we're not as naturally gifted in. But if I keep telling myself, oh, I'm just not good with names, I'm just not good with names, you're making that a part of your identity. And that's kind of what James Clear talks about. Atomic Habits is a really great read by James Clear for folks who haven't heard of it because I think it's on your shelf back there. There we go. Yeah, yeah he talks so about... Go ahead. If you want to really get deep, get this book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Shad Helmstetter. Okay. He literally talks about, and you'll hear Tony Robbins talk about this, but this is an old book. He talks about the very specific way that you need to talk when, you're, when you have self-talk, right? It's always got to be in the positive. It's always got to be in the present, right? You can't say, for example, I will be a non -smoke. I will stop smoking. Right? You have to say, I am a non-smoker, right? Mm. Something like that. But it, it, there's lots of little nuances that he talks about to kind of help you that, that self-talk if you're going to engage. Tony Robbins talks a lot about this, literally like making tapes of things that you want to have in your self-talk and like just listening to that. You want to talk about an unfair career advantage, getting what's in between your, in between your ears, right? And so if you historically struggled with I'm not a great communicator. I'm not a great storyteller. I'm not a great presenter. Shifting that to, I am a great presenter. I am a great presenter. And then you keep saying that and you'll start to shift your identity and then your habits follow. Instead of folks being like, well, once I do these seven things or have accomplished this, then I can say I'm a good presenter. It actually works the other way. I'm sure you've heard this as well. And I forget who was the first one to popularize it. That whole idea of be, do, have. Mm -hmm. right? If I want to have these things, then I have to do certain things to get them. And in order to do those things consistently to get to that, I have to be the type of person that repeatedly does those things. So it's then kind of looking back at like at an identity level. 
Mm. Who am I? What type of person am I? And I need to make myself the type of person that does the things that get me where I want to go. And it, again, you could go really deep down the rabbit hole, but at a real high, simple level, it's really kind of reverse engineering, whatever the yeah. thing is that you're after. That's good. That's good. So, so take, a, take it for someone maybe who is five, seven years in their career and they say they're in Anaplan being successful and they say, I want to be a CTO or CIO. Okay. You have to view yourself as that first and then do the things that they do. And then you will have yeah. what they have. I think I may have told you the story about a guy that I worked with when I was at Arby's and he told everybody that would listen that he was going to be a CFO one day. And he literally back engineered it. He went and sat down with like every CEO that would give them the time, him the time of day and kind of ask them about their path to becoming a CFO and then mapped out, okay, all of them have these things in common that they did. They had these jobs, they had these degrees, they got this experience and he kind of mapped out, okay, now how do I make that happen? And I watched through his career as he moved through like a director in planning. And then I think he was like a, a director of IT. Then he was a controller and step, he was checking off the list. But before he did that, he found out from someone who had already been there, what's that path look like? That is pure gold. That is an unfair career advantage. If you are listening to this show and you want to advance your career, think about what that end goal, that North Star is for you and back engineer based on talking to people who have done that, what you need to do and then begin to chart your path. I love it. John, we're coming up on time here, so I'll get you out on this. You're you're speaking, you're, you're training. What, what's kind of next for you? Do you have a big, hairy, audacious goal you're going after? It could be personal, could be professional. Just what's, what's kind of your next big thing that you're pursuing? Yeah, so I guess on the business front, one of the things that's been on my back burner that I'm desperately trying to get to the front burner is to translate my current business, to transform my current business into an online academy. When I first became aware of like all the different types of like business models you could have, I realized that trading time for money is the absolute worst business model in the world, right? I have to physically be doing something to make money. And so I'm working on putting together recorded courses that I can put online so that I can create it once and then have that where people can buy that and access it whenever they want 24 seven so that I can kind of break that chain of tying time to money. That's a big one for me. That's an awesome answer. Definitely a worthy pursuit. Where can people connect with you outside of the show? Easiest place to find me is on my website, johnsanchezusa.com. And there's links there to find me in all of social media, my podcast, More Than Word Show, uh, which is on YouTube. You just go on YouTube and type in More Than Word Show with John Sanchez. If you don't put my name in, you'll get the, the song from the 80s. <laughs> Y'all, if you want an unfair career advantage and you want to improve your communication skills, your delivery skills, check out the More Than Words podcast. Visit John's website. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Wherever you're consuming this, if it's YouTube, if it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, we appreciate you. Make sure you're subscribed. We have a lot more amazing guests on the way, a lot more great content. We're doing our best to bring you value and have fun while we do it. And we really want this to be a career advantage listening to this show and we want you to enjoy it. So it means a lot. Make sure you're subscribed for what's, what's to come. And also, if you're up for it, it would mean a lot if you leave us a like, a comment, a rating, a review, whatever platform you're on. That really helps and it gets us fired up when we see those. So I appreciate you guys. Find us on LinkedIn. I'm Blake Bozarth, my co-host Chad Pike with a Y. Would love to connect with you there. Have an awesome day. See you next time. Peace.